Agrippa is very much about memory, even in, in the way that it's packaged. It's uh, because it, it, in terms of the original packaging, you can only have the experience once, and then you'd have to have the you'd have to have a memory of the experience. So that was, in a sense, one of the points of making something that, that sort of erased itself as you read it and couldn't be restored. Memory seems to have intrigued you since the start of your career. Did you plan on using cyberspace as a metaphor for memory when you first sat down to write Neuromancer? Well, I think I was always aware of cyberspace as a, as a metaphor for memory. It's, it's a very, very conscious riff throughout all of, the, all of those books. It's, uh, it sort of surprised me. I mean, one thing that I, I was sort of disappointed in the response to the book was how few, people, how few people picked up on it. I just think that's because of relatively few people reading science fiction at an, at an adult metaphoric level. So most of that just goes right, goes right over people's heads. But even though it's quite, it's very strongly underlined all through all through the text and, and in a sense those three books are an exploration of memory of, of what memory is at what point do you think that readers should clue into the fact that your trilogy is about memory the, the, I think it's fairly clear in uh, there's a scene in there's a scene in Neuromancer where one of the uh, artificial intelligences is, is manifesting two case as the fin in a in a simulacrum of the fin shop and delivers this weird little uh, sort of cod shakespearean piece of oratory about the nature of computation and the nature of memory and it's in, invoking uh, stonehenge as a calculator and it's just a little bit that goes by but it's it's sort of all it's it's right there i mean it's it's saying you know it's about memory, and the, as I recall, the, the artificial intelligence says, if, if, you had, if you had ever bothered to develop a holographic model of memory, we wouldn't have to be going through this dance as I try to become conscious. Right. Exploring memory through machine intelligence is a central theme in science fiction. Arthur C. Clarke's classic novel, 2001 A Space Odyssey, uses a mysterious alien monolith and the monolithic computer HAL to contrast all the various levels of human memory. And in the sequel, 2010, we learn that repressed memories are what drove HAL to commit murder. Luckily for the spacefaring humans in the novel Use of Weapons, the machine intelligence that runs the starship Xenophobe is more tolerant of them than Hal was of Dave. Ian, in Use of Weapons, I love the way you contrasted the very accurate memory of the machine intelligence with the dark, repressed memories of your hero. Why are you so fascinated by memory? I can't remember, sorry. Ah, oh, the cheap joke number 37B. Um, <laughs> Good question. I'm glad you asked me that. What would a politician say? What we're going to talk about anyway, in regards to the question. Um, getting older, as I am, um, you sort of gradually start to realise that, well, that might actually be fun for a start to, to go back further into the, the, the depths of your character's uh, sort of soul, if you like, mm -hmm. to find out why they're doing these things. I mean, up to, up to a point, you can tell the yarn, if you like, just by the character doing certain things. You're like, ah, the hero. Therefore, the hero will you know, do decent things and the baddies will be baddies and all the rest of it. But once you start getting into motivations and thinking, well, why are they doing that? What is the point of this? What is making them do this? You know, what personal goals whatever have they got? Um, it becomes a, quite a fascinating exercise on its own. And it's that suddenly what you, what's perhaps has been a story that you've lived with and thought about for you know, oh, years and years and years, um, can actually uh, assume some more, more depth to it. Uh, and obviously what you want to do is then put that depth across to, you know, to the reader, so that you know, when they read the thing, it actually means more to them than just being you know, an action-adventure yarn or, or whatever. Um, so I think it's, just, it's trying to add that emotional depth to it. Right, but that link between memory and identity is key to almost all your books, right from the start with The Wasp Factory. It is, yeah. It took me a while to, to realize that, actually. Um, yeah, identity, this, I mean, especially uh, an uncertain identity, you know, an identity that people, even the person themselves, doesn't really understand. You know, like, you know, the ending of The Wasp Factory being you know, a fairly good example. Uh, and again, at the end of Use of Weapons as well. Um, 
Yes, and there's, there's, there always seems to be something about identity. I, I, where that comes from, I do not know. I mean, I've always been, you know, I've always sort of uh, known where I came from, you know. I've got my mum and dad are still around and alive, and, you know, you know um, there's all these sort of standard things you might imagine that uh, I could have got that from, you know, personally, why I'm obsessed with this thing about identity. I haven't, I haven't come with any sort of glib Freudian explanation yet, you know. But I'm sure there is one, you know, but I just haven't thought of it yet. Brian, memory has always been an important part of your fiction, but why did you feel it was the right time to record your own recollections on paper? Uh, why? Well, you see, for one thing, you have a chance to sit in judgment on yourself. And I think that that's very important, that uh, you should finally reach some sort of age where you can look back and see what you've done, often unwittingly, just as you write your early novels unwittingly for the fun finding out you can do it. You did so many things in life for the fun of finding you can do it. Uh, but when you have to think about it, uh, you have to rely on memory. And quite frequently, you find that uh, the storehouse of memory, whatever that is, has edited out all kinds of things. Not just the bad things you did, but the good. That's amazing. A couple of years ago, I was at a, a dinner party with friends, and a guy came up to me and said, I was at school with you. My name is David Wingfield. I don't suppose you remember me, because I was only at that school for one term. It was such a horrible place that my father took me away. Uh, well, I said, no, it's true, I don't remember you. So he said, you did me a great kindness. You had written a story called The Adventures of a Shilling, and you let me read it. That was the one decent thing that was done to me in that school. Do you remember that story? Well, I'd completely forgotten that story. But then the memory came back of having written this story, with which I was quite pleased. What was I, 16? And finding this kid in a corner crying and to comfort him and saying, oh, here you are, son, Look, read this. So good things come back as well as bad. In your story, Particle Theory, when your protagonist, Nick, goes to a hypnotist to try to enhance his memories of his dead wife, it got me wondering how big a role memories play in shaping who we are. I think our memories shape who we are in two very important ways. First of all, what we do remember, you know, causes us to make the, it's part of, a large part of how we make the decisions that we, we do. But something that's always fascinated me is how lack of memory or lack of memory or, or, or forgetting of things also influences how we act. Um, I used to think that when one became an adult that uh, so much of behavior would be predicated on whether one screwed up, what made mistakes, and how one learned from those mistakes. And uh, again, I, I don't mean to talk like somebody who is in his 80th or 90th year, which I am, if I'm well preserved, uh, but I see all the people around me, it seems like, so much of the time, forgetting things that happened to them, forgetting what they went through, and making the same mistakes over and over again. So uh, you know, the, this becomes a much more complex it seems that the reason that we remember certain things and forget other things has everything to do with the interaction between the, le the left and the right hem hemispheres. Sorry, I've run out of power and I completely forgot to talk about amnesia. I know, we'll do it next time. Tune in, I'll talk to David Cronenberg and Samuel R. Delaney and Ray Bradbury and who else, Nancy? Who else with? Right. Next week on Second Nature, was the splintering of the Soviet Union, Yugoslavia, and Czechoslovakia engineered by a secret consortium of profit-hungry mapmakers, Atlas publishers, and globe manufacturers? <laughs>